This lecture focuses on the celebrated Mexican lithographer, Jose Guadalupe Posada Aguilar. He was born in 1852 and died in 1913. The lecture covers three things. The first part of the lecture offers a brief review of Posada's biography. In the second part of the lecture, we will analyze certain aspects of the artist's personal life as well as historic events in Mexico because these profoundly influenced Posada's art. And this part of the lecture also explains the process of engraving and how Posada used this medium. And the third and last part of the lecture analyzes themes in some of Posada's most enduring artworks. The lecture closes with a reflection on Posada's artistic legacy. Let's begin. Jose Guadalupe Posada Aguilar was born in Aguascalientes, Mexico. His parents were Germán Posada Serna and Petra Aguilar Portillo. Reportedly, he had seven siblings. In 1875, he married Maria de Jesus Varela, with whom he remained married until her death in 1910. Posada considered his son, Juan Sabino, his heir apparent. At his workshop, Posada trained his young son in the art of engraving, drawing, and design. In addition, Posada enrolled his son in an academy to learn the art of photography. And this photograph that you saw at, in the first slide is of Posada over here. No one has been able to identify these two individuals, something that this may be his son and something that his son was taking the photograph. Posada's talent emerged at an early age. By age 15, official records in Aguascalientes show that he had already registered as an artist. In the 1890s, he moved to Mexico City, where he continued a prolific career. Posada worked very intensely from 1910 until his death in 1913. Scholars report that during his career, he made anywhere from 15 to 20,000 artworks. And here I included his signature, so you can, can familiarize yourself with it. When he was very young, Posada learned drawing at La Academia Municipal de Dibujo de Aguascalientes, where his brother Cirilo taught. Cirilo taught him to read, to write, and drawing. And Posada learned design from his brother and his uncle, who had a career in ceramics. Art certainly ran in this family. A notable influence in Posada's life was the artist Manuel Alfonso Manilla. Manuel Alfonso Manilla actually preceded Posada in the use of skulls, which in Spanish is calaveras, and in Mexican slang or colloquial Spanish in Mexico is calacas. And the two artists worked well together. Okay, this concludes the brief biographical sketch on Posada. And I just want to emphasize two things, that in 1872, he moved to León, Guanajuato, to work in a workshop as a lithographer under Trinidad Pedroso's tutelage, where he produced numerous artworks, including satirical work for a newspaper called El Jicote, the Wasp, or the Bumblebee, something that stings. And the other thing is that in the 90s, he moved to Mexico City where he joined Antonio Vanegas Arroyo's publishing house. And there he continued the prolific career that he had begun in Aguascalientes and then León. So this timeline is to help you to see the big picture. And this is what we're going to look at in succession in section two. So it's a bit of biography, but in relation to artworks. For example, we're going to look at, at how natural disasters, personal laws, and the Mexican Revolution, how that affected him personally and his, and his artistic production. I provide a list here so I don't lose you. And so in section two, we're going to look at this. And briefly, I'll explain to you the process of engraving because it's really cool. Okay, section two. Posada is widely known as an artist for two things. Number one, using skeletal imagery, not in this case, though, but that's what we're going, to, we're going to have a look at that later on in the lecture. But for his political satire, he loved to call politicians on their corruption. 
And this is one of the early works by Posada. Posada is not even out of his teens. He's under 20 years old here. And in this work, published in the newspaper El Jicote in July of 1871, here Posada has depicted various local politicians from Aguascalientes. And here in the middle, we see Jesus Figuroso Lopez holding this pole, which is greased. And various other politicians are either climbing the pole or helping those to helping others to climb or even watching the action to, to see what is going on here. And what is going on here is that there's a parrot. And this guy here is looking with a spyglass. And these po corrupt politicians are trying to climb it. And they're probably trying to reach this parrot called Cotorra Gonzalez, which is how Posada depicted the publisher of, the, of El Jicote. And he was called, this character was Cotorra Gonzalez. So the Cotorra, meaning that he talked a lot about what these guys are doing, the, what these horrible things these guys are doing to the people. <laughs> and humorously, he writes here, Función de acrobatas, um, which means acrobatic show, referring to the pole and the and that they're all trying to get to the parrot. <laughs> now, mind you, this is this is a this the joke is on the politicians, not on the publisher, because it's a cotorra means a cotorra means a parrot. The parrot repeats everything that they see. And what that refers to is that this Cotorra, in this case Cotorra Gonzalez, is parroting and repeating everything in the newspaper, is repeating everything in the newspaper that these guys do, all, all the horrible crimes and injustices that they do to remain in power and steal people's money. And look at this. I mean, this, this is amazing. It's, the politicians are trying to... They're all in cahoots in trying to get this parrot, which, you know, he's he's trying to show that these guys make like a circus, Función de Acrobatas, which translates to acrobatic show. Oh, and here's his signature, by the way. A couple of other things is that Posada is denouncing the corrupt politicians, not the parrot. This is just a joke because the publisher obviously is in cahoots with Posada. And in fact, El Jicote had to was closed down by the politicians because they succeeded in toppling the regime of Colonel Jesus Gomez Portugal, for example, who was the governor of Aguascalientes. And because of the things that they published constantly in El Jicote, he was finally removed in, in fair elections. And just to show you what, what a circus this really was, is that this Colonel Gomez Portugal showed up showed up in September of 1871 after he lost the elections he shows up in the governor's palace mind you on horseback he entered the building on his horse and with an armed mob demanding that he he be given his post as governor back unfortunately soon after the, the newspaper was was closed and this led to great to a lot of suppression of the press because politicians knew how powerful the press can be. The fact that politicians successfully closed the newspaper because how dangerous they were, I would argue that this event was very important in shaping who Posada became as an as an artist. Unfortunately, he learned early on about political censorship. And this is one of the reasons why Posada and Trinidad Pedroso, the publisher and owner of the, of the printing press, why they moved, why they had to move to León, Guanajuato, because they were being absolutely harassed in Aguascalientes. Mexico, by the way, is one of the countries in Latin America that has a long and illustrious history in printing, newspapers, and magazines. Now, as everybody knows, 
Printing using woodblocks began in China in the Tang Dynasty before the 8th century. And that made its way to, to the rest of Asia and Africa and the Middle East. And eventually, it reached Europe in the 1400s. And after the conquest in 1492 or 1521, to be exact, for Mexico, Mesoamerica had a long-established tradition of making books, screenful manuscripts. And perhaps not surprisingly, the printing press comes to Mexico in the 1500s. The printing press, as used in Europe, comes to Mexico very early on. I moved to Mexico with my family from 2011 to 2012. And my brother-in-law came to visit us. And he lives in Manhattan. And he loves newspapers. And we couldn't believe when he told us that in Mexico City alone, he counted 25 Yes, you heard right, 25 newspapers published daily in Mexico City alone. And nevertheless, um, journalism is a very dangerous profession in Mexico still. All righty, I could go on all day here, but let's move on. And another fun fact is that in, in the 19th century, printed items, including newspapers and magazines, but also ephemera, and I'll show you in a minute a few examples of ephemera, which are little tiny books with, with 4 to 20 pages, are extremely popular and remain extremely popular. And here's some data on the history of printing and woodblock printing, which I said began in China during the Tang Dynasty. And this is a sample of movable types found in the Mogao Caves. So printing begins early on. And here are more details of what I was just talking about and the screen folds in Mesoamerica. And this is a photograph from the printing press, which came to Mexico in 1539. And these are the few examples of ephemera that I said that I would show you. I found this film on YouTube called Posada El Genio Desconocido, in case you want to see it, but it's in, it, it's in Spanish though. And this historian, Agustin Sanchez, said, Posada está en cada pedacito de los mexicanos. Prácticamente no hubo un solo campo donde no estuviera posada. Translates to, posada is in every inch of the Mexican people. Practically, there was not a single field where posada would not be. So printing and, and ephemera were very, were at the core of, of posada's gift. Ephemera is popular memorabilia. It's printed in bulk for the masses. People buy it, it's ma- distributed in mass, and it's very popular and inexpensive. And it's and it's to be enjoyed for a brief time. For for and that's why it's called ephemera. It's it's very short lived. And for example, this is what's this is called a broadsheet, which sometimes was just printed on the front just one side, and then people would affix this to the wall or to decorate, but it, it was ephemera. It was not. And then sometimes he would make little posada would work on artworks to grace the cover of books, playbills, broadsheets, and you name it, he did it. Posada made artworks to grace the cover of chapbooks, for example, which are very, sm- which are tiny books with illustrations, like engravings or woodcuts. And it had only very few pages from four to 24. And Posada would have commissions of just about anything from covers for children, songbooks, instructionals, or recipe books, to almanacs, to the churches would actually commission things, advertisements, he even made even labels for cigarettes, game boards and card games, love letters, plays and playbills. So an example in the previous slide, and personal products, including people would come into commission announcements for births or baptisms or marriages and he would do sensational news and things like that but also he continued throughout his life to produce a lot of satire in newspapers and i'm about to tell you a story that is so relevant to understanding posada's work because posada was telling the story of the underclass in mexico and how a governing elite subjugated them Newspapers were very 
fundamental in toppling the regime of this politician here, Porfirio Diaz, who in 1876 established himself president and, and basically a, a, a dictator of Mexico until 1911, when people successfully removed him. So we'll go over that story in a little more detail. And in Mexico in the, 19th, the late 19th century, there were many newspapers dedicated to denouncing the corruption in the government. And look at here, I wrote that El Jicote, the newspaper where Posada published, was closed after 11 editions because I just told you that they were very successful in, in bringing down corrupt, corrupt politicians. And this one is one of the most famous, which is called El Hijo del Aguisote. Aguisote was the name of this Aztec king who ruled Tenochtitlan, which is Mexico City, from 1486 to 1502. Here he is depicted in a colonial manuscript, and this is his name glyph. And as I'll explain to you in a second, Diaz loved to censure the press. He could not stand any criticism from the press. And he was ruthless. And for example, these very famous brothers, Flores Magón, that's their last name, Flores Magón. These are some of the newspapers where they published. And their name is Jesús, Ricardo, and Enrique Flores Magón. But Ricardo was the most radical of them. And here he is in this like really cool image that I found, photograph that I found, which is really cool. Mis cinco cuates, my five friends. He was put in jail several times for speaking his mind in the press. Now we're going to come back to the to Porfirio Diaz, to the Mexican Revolution. Absolutely. I'm just showing you right now first, in chronological order, some of the major events that shaped Posada. And I think that this introduction will help you to understand his body of work a little bit better. The fact that Trinidad Pedroso had to leave Aguascalientes and establish a new printing press in León, Guanajuato. And a year later, Trinidad Pedroso calls for Posada. And so that's when Posada moves to León in Guanajuato. But there he experienced another traumatic event in 1887 when there was a horrible flood and reportedly some of his relatives died. Hundreds disappeared, never to be found. Much of Posada's workshop was destroyed as well. And the artist and art historian, Jean Charlot, he's a really well-known artist. He lived in Mexico in the 20th century and he lived in a place adjacent to a lady, and the lady told Jean Charlot that Posada was traumatized by the floods in Leon because he remembered that during the flood, he would see some people and relatives just be dragged by the flood, and Posada was unable to save them, to hold on to them, and they died asking Posada to save them. And I learned all that from an article that Jean Charlot, I told you he was an accomplished art historian who also collected Posada's art, which he donated to institutions, including the Met, University of Hawaii, etc. By the way, the lady who told Charlot all this was the widow of Antonio Vanegas Arroyo. And this is from Charlot's, Charlot's article. It says, the widow of Don Antonio, a charming and able matriarch who used to call me with a twinkle, El Francesito. That means the little French guy because he was of French and U.S. heritage. He was born in France, though. Liked to recall Posada's often told story. How in the floods of Leon in 1887, many members of his family drowned. How they would be carried past him by the churning waters and cry, save us, Don Jose, until they sank. And here in this image, he's showing La Inundación de León. And this one, even though, it, and this one is actually published in the 1890s because it's saying, Publicadas por Vanegas Arroyo. This is the publisher for whom he worked in Mexico City. And this is what I was saying. This is for a very small book, Colección de Canciones Modernas, 
So this is for a collection of, of, of songs, lyrics are inside, but then you would have, but then, so people would buy it, you would grace it with something interesting in the cover. It's a commemoration of the inundations that were so devastating in León. And here we see another publication from Vanegas Arroyo, also of for canciones modernas, for modern songs. This one has another catastrophe, Porfirio Diaz. <laughs> Porfirio Diaz in the cover. And um, I cannot help but think that Posada was actually thinking like that too. And I just want to read this quote that I found. What Elon Stavans summarizes so well is some of the themes that I'm going to highlight in the rest of the lecture. It says, Political cartoons and idiosyncratic comic strips are immensely popular throughout Mexico, and Posada is considered the founding father of the genre. Every significant historic event of his epoch appears in his cartoons. He ridiculed the dictatorship of Porfirio Diaz, a mixed-blooded general from Oaxaca who fought the French invasion in the 1860s, whereby Napoleon III, that's a typo, it's not, it's the third, installed the Austrian Archduke Maximilian of Habsburg as Emperor of Mexico. Posada also made fun of Mexico's huge foreign debt and of the colonization of Cuba by the United States. He lampooned his country's bourgeoisie for their arrogance and new sensational canards to stir up additional excitement. One of the most devastating personal tragedies that Posada would come, that Posada was to sustain, would come in the year 1900, when his son Juan Sabino Posada died of exanthematous typhus. An added layer of this tragedy is that at the time of his son's illness and death, Posada was away, and when he came back, his son had been dead for two weeks. His wife had tried everything she could do to nurse him back to health. She called doctors, but nothing worked. While Posada would live another 13 years, he never really recovered from this blow. He began to drink heavily and also began to work very intensely. In the 13 years that he would live in the 20th century, Posada created a large archive of artworks that included sensational news and attracted the imagination of a public, including this one, the infamous son who poisoned his parents. And this one, a woman who gave birth to three children and four animals. Here's the lady who gave birth, and these are the three human babies, and then the four, the four, the four dinosaurs or creatures, and the astonished people depicted here who can attest to the veracity that this happened. But it also turned to some somber themes, including the despair that people felt, including here including in this one titled A Woman Discovering a Man Who Has Committed Suicide by Hanging Himself from a Balcony. And this one, and this broadsheet depicting a firing squad performing an execution. And this one of general interest, providing news about a new clock that was installed in the cathedral in Mexico. Or this thought-provoking one with a woman and a strange being in the form of a dog with the head of a human. <laughs> that says, great scandalous alarm that was seen around Chihuahua when the sad laments were heard of a little duck with Teresa, and Teresa would be the woman here, who could not feel his belly because of poverty. Another one is his broadsheet. Posada created this artwork in 1913, the year he died. This image in particular would catapult him into immortality. This is one of his most popular and recognized pieces. And there is so much thought behind the use of skulls and skeletons because this skull is using fancy hats imported from France or Europe. And look at the text that he uses. Calaveras, which is skulls, empolvadas, powdered, referring to the makeup she wears, and garbanceras, which are this chickpeas. And all of this is meant to criticize those who wanted to appear European as opposed to local or for Mexico. And one of the things he wants to emphasize with the use of these skulls and skeletons is that 
is that people are very silly to be worried about class, culture, status, ethnicity, politics, and all those things that concern us in our culture. Because Posada thinks that at the end of the day, all that people are, are this, skulls and skeletons. He said, La muerte es democrática, ya que al fin de cuentas, fuera o morena, rica o pobre, toda la gente acaba siendo calaveras. That translates to, death is democratic because at the end of the day, blonde or brunette, rich or poor, everyone ends up being skulls. And here I provide a glossary of terms that Posada used in his broadsheet. Katrina is a well-dressed, elegant person in 19th century Mexico who imitated European aristocracy. This term is very much associated with Posada, but he was the celebrated Mexican muralist Diego Rivera who popularized this term. Calavera, you already know, it's skull. And Garbancera, the one who either sells or eats chickpeas, particularly the white type, as opposed to the as opposed to the more common types, which are smaller, darker, and coarser. The white ones are, are larger and softer. And then empolvada is literally full of powder and refers to the makeup that people used to appear more European or whiter. And just one quick thing about the text that appears in this ephemera. For example, over here, this is a broadsheet that Posada made in honor of the publisher. So Posada, so Posada was as democratic as death. Here he's poking fun at his publisher. Here he say to the popular editor, Vanegas Arroyo. And here he is with various themes relating to engraving and publishing and writing. Over here is the artist working around the clock and his skeleton selling the ephemera. And I'm not sure that you can see it, but he's poking fun at the bourgeoisie that is, that is him, one of the rich including his publisher, and he's holding a $1,000 peso, which at that time was a lot of money. This type of ephemera would have captions or satirical verses that Posada wrote in collaboration with this publisher, but also with the poet Constancio Suarez, who was from Oaxaca, though he died in 1895. And just to show you very quickly the type of verses that the ephemera that they sold would have. And here it says, El que quiera leer esta hoja suelta, cinco centavos es lo que le cuesta. That means whoever wants to read this loose sheet, five cents is all that it will cost the person. Or this one. El que quiera imponerse de estos esqueletos, cinco centavos pagará completos. The same thing. Like whoever wants to obtain this broadsheet with skeletons must pay five cents. And in Spanish, they, these rhymes are super cute. Posada really liked to make fun of the wealthy people because he thought they were very silly. And this engraving is called The Horrible Death of an Invidious Rich Man. And invidious would be someone really obnoxious, someone given to resentment or anger. And here you see this, this horrible looking beast, greed, lust, laziness, rage, gluttony, pride or hubris jealousy. Ironically, the monsters that are going to kill him resemble him. It's almost like uh, these creatures attacking him are very similar to him. Look at the treatment of the hands, the, the hair, the eyes, the mouth. So all of these themes that Posada is referring in these artworks have much to do with social forces felt in Mexican society in the late 19th and early 20th century. Why the focus on ridiculing the wealthy class? Maybe that's a silly question, but in the context of this particular time period, the answer is a little bit more interesting because the question is much more complex. Answers can be found in these two important historic periods that are, are indelibly referred in Posada's work. The first one is the Porfiriato, which is what historians called President Porfirio Diaz's regime, lasting from 1876 to 1911. And the second one would be the Mexican Revolution, one of the most significant upheavals in modern Mexican history. 
the decade-long conflict in which all Mexican society participated lasted from 1910 until 1920. Scholars report that it left over a million people dead. The second half of the 19th century would be a period of tremendous changes in Mexico and all of Latin America. In 1821, most countries in Latin America had become independent from either Spain or Portugal. Brazil, for example, became independent from Portugal. And yet, Porfirio Diaz and all presidents in Latin America, from Mexico all the way down to Argentina, all of Central America, all of South America, all of them had their eyes fixed, absolutely obsessed with European government, culture, and people. Most Latin American countries at this time embraced a strange French philosophy called positivism. Politicians embraced positivistic ideas to advance their political agenda. The 19th century rhetoric was that order and progress was the way to take Latin American countries out of what they considered to be backwardness or primitivism. The idea was that the policies that they conceived would help the newly emerged countries to develop on their own, now that they were independent from Europe. Perhaps ironically, in terms of government, culture, for example, in the production of art, the model to follow or emulate would be Paris and Europe. Mexico became extremely wealthy during the Porfiriato. However, land, prestige, all of that was concentrated in one single man, Porfirio Diaz, and his close circle of technocrats whom he called Cientificos, or the Scientific Ones. And given that Mexico had so many resources, Mexico became extremely wealthy, and some accumulated unimaginable wealth. While it is true that during the Porfiriato, Mexico became, Mexico built its infrastructure, including roads, bridges, and modes of transportation, particularly the train, the administration and system was horrible in distributing that wealth more fairly among the people of Mexico. The Porfiriato created a vast sector of disenfranchised, many of whom were of indigenous descent who lived in absolute abject poverty. And Posada is writing about all of this story in his art. He's portraying the, the governing elite and what, they're, what it's doing to the vast majority of the people. And he's actually depicting the indigenous peoples and the everyday people. The Porfiriato was so successful in creating so much wealth because it set up policies that made the vast majority of the poor pay with their land and cheap labor. Among the most devastating laws, the ones that most contributed to the concentration of land and wealth was the one that forced indigenous peoples abandon their ancient manner of land tenure. This is something they had done since pre-Columbian times, which was to own land communally. But Diaz forced them to partition the land so that each would become individual owners. Now, that may sound great, but it was actually a system that made it easier for them to lose their land. Diaz advanced this idea that indigenous people's land tenure practices and their culture were, were an impediment, were an obstacle to building the nation, developing and progressing. Unfortunately, with those laws and with indigenous peoples as individual owners, when they needed help, instead of relying on each other, they turned to banks and other government in, and other institutions, and that's how many of them lost their lands. So Diaz's system, in effect, made it easier for hacendados to take land from indigenous peoples. And that's how land ended up in a few hands. And how most of those people losing their land became peons who provided very cheap labor. And that is the hacienda system. And it's a little bit like feudalism in Europe. And the reason that Diaz was successful in passing these laws is because he did everything he could to have Mexicans embrace modernism, including wanting to have the train, participate in globalization, and later bringing electricity. One of the things that politicians said when they wanted to take indigenous people's lands is that they said that indigenous peoples were not using land efficiently because they used it to plant for self-subsistence. All of that was made under the rhetoric of the 19th century order and progress. The governing elite tried to promote an idea that the indigenous peoples were backwards in their ways and that they have to embrace 
European culture so that the country can be modern and rich. The rhetoric of the 19th century governing elite in Latin America is reflected in this beautiful landscape by the celebrated Mexican artist Jose Maria Velasco, titled El Citlal de Peto from 1879, features a landscape that is full of resources, including water and land, as far as the eye can see. And the train, the ultimate symbol of modernity in the 19th century, appears in the right side of the painting. And while it takes center stage, it actually blends nicely. It's almost inconspicuous in this landscape. And as it slithers on the ground, it mirrors the path of this beautiful river, which is life itself. In the 19th century, most people traveled on horseback, and so the train was a huge boost for moving goods and services and people very fast. And look at this one. Again, it's showing here the rails of the train and then the train. It's making its way, bringing wealth, goods and resources to people. Is the order in progress that the governments in Latin America wanted. And in this painting, also by Velasco, the train is not interfering with our enjoyment of nature, including the, the lush landscape and the clear water. In fact, the exhaust blends seamlessly almost with the, in the lush forest. The colors that Velasco uses evoke the clouds of trees here, and then the exhaust from the sides also evoke the waterways. And it's showing a Mexican landscape that is without people or without buildings. Both the painting and this photograph of the same bridge, by the way, are first another story. First of all, the train is bringing, up, is bringing externalities to this region, and it's affecting the quality of air, water, and the quality of life of the people who lived here. And here's Porfirio Diaz posing with the exquisitely carved Aztec calendar. While Porfirio Diaz took pride in Mexico's illustrious pre-Columbian past, the plight of the indigenous peoples and the poor were horrendous under his regime. He instituted the Hacienda system, which at its core was the concentration of land into the hands of few. So this was a little bit like a plantation system in the United States. And while it was great for a few, for Porfirio Diaz and his close circle, it was tragic for the vast majority of Mexicans because they lived in abject poverty. In fact, Posada was one of those poor because even though he worked intensely for most of his life and after his son's death, he began to work more intensely recording all of this story that I'm telling you, his son died of something that could have been treated had he had access to adequate medical care. And while the vast majority of Mexicans lived in abject poverty, a few in the upper echelons of society enjoyed trips abroad or leisure. Here they're playing games in the Hacienda system. Here in another one of Velasco's paintings, was regarded as an idyllic place. Look how inobtrusive the, the hacienda itself is and how it's showing the gorgeous Mexican landscape, its beautiful skies, and all this greenery here. But it doesn't show that that wealth and that concentration was at the expense of the vast majority of people. And they lost their land. They had very little avenue to get out of their own situation. And the indigenous peoples, under the rhetoric of order and progress, are made to feel bad about, about their ancient traditions. Look at this study that I found by William Signet, talking about the concentration of land. And this is a process that began in the 1880s. And this is throughout Latin America, not just here. But he's talking about Mexican land reform in this particular case. But this is almost like verbatim the same story all over Latin America. It says, the disparity in land holding among hacendados and companies on the one hand and the millions of rural peons on the other became unhinged. One fifth of 1% of the total number of private landowners owned 87% of the private land. Of the 42 million hectares of vacant land, and, and look at, he's putting it on quotes, vacant land delivered to the nation through staking, 90% was ceded to 12 individuals. 
of a total Mexican population of 15.3 million in 1910, 11,000 persons and 50 surveying companies controlled 54% of the national territory. So the policies during the Porfiriato, since the 1880s until now, Signet is taking us all the way to 1910, the start of the Mexican Revolution. This is the ambience. Land has been concentrated on the haciendas, on a few very, very wealthy people, the hacendados. And at these haciendas, what this painting doesn't show is the fact that many of the people working here had owned this land before, number one. And number two, were forced to work sometimes every day. And they were supposed to work not by just labor laws, which said you have to be paid over time or you have to, or you have, to have days off, etc. One of the things that happens in the 19th century is that with, with the establishment of infrastructure and policies that collect taxes from people, the government collected a lot of revenues. With all of that, Mexico was able to, to establish not, not only the governments, but, but more importantly, a police force, including the federales. The hacendados and the government now had a way to deal with troublemakers, who were the people who complained about the poor working conditions and the extremely low wages, and those people whom they identified as being dangerous to the hacienda system. The government now had, had the federales come in, and they would take the person complaining and kill them by hanging. And the families of the victim were forbidden from retrieving the body because they wanted that execution to be a deterrent. They wanted people to say, this is what's going to happen to you if you start complaining. And Posada is recording all of this. See, in this one, the hanged man, revolutionary hanged by the hacendados. This is what they did when people complained about the system. And here's a police force. Before 1914, they were called federales. The Mexican government, this is again all over Latin America, the same story. After becoming independent, you're no longer a colony. There was a struggle to start the nation. But once it got started and they started collecting taxes, they were able to establish armed forces. So this military was very fundamental in helping the governing elite, in this case Porfirio Diaz, during the Porfiriato, obtain what they called order so that the country would attain, would attain progress. Though we now know that that progress meant for just very few. Progress meant we have the haciendas. And here's another one of Posada's pieces, satirically titled, Today's Execution, as in like every day. And here, por menores de la ejecución, details of the execution. In Guadalupe Posada and journalists, especially the Flores Magón brothers, were very good at denouncing the injustices under Porfirio Díaz. Journalists and artists like Posada were so fundamental in recording and denouncing all of the excesses of the Díaz administration. Because here is recorded in photographs what the governing elite was doing to those people who complained and the troublemakers who dared to ask for better working conditions or a return to their lands. Artists were not depicting the indigenous peoples of the downtrodden, but Posada was. And here he is depicting how the governing elite sent for the executions of the Zapatistas, the people behind land reform. And here are the people witnessing that, that event. And this beautifully encapsulates that story that I was telling you. The troublemakers were hanged outside and the families of the victims were not allowed to retrieve the body because they were to be examples of what not to do. And over here, what is it doing to the people observing this firing squad, killing the Zapatistas? Now, the Mexican Revolution is a pretty remarkable period in history. As unbelievable as it may seem to you, there was a large group of wealthy people who also had grievances. And for example, here you see Francisco Madero was very wealthy. And these men in particular wanted to run for president. And Porfirio Diaz was not allowing anybody to run for president because he had become, like I said, he had established himself as a dictator. Now, the Mexican Revolution is very much associated with Francisco Madero. And he was very fundamental, absolutely. In fact, 
he signed here. Here he is signing the plan San Luis Potosí, which this is actually pretty cool. Um, as you can see, the, the whole country was unhappy with Porfirio Diaz. He had to go. The plan San Luis Potosí states the revolution began on Sunday, November 20th, 1910 at 6 p.m. And this message was sent out to all anti-re-election clubs, meaning we are not going to re-elect Porfirio Diaz. It's the only plan in the world that calls for revolution at, at an exact time. Look, time, date, everything. And here's Francisco Madero campaigning and people are following him because Mexicans want is just to get rid of Porfirio Diaz. And the whole country was so jubilant with Francisco Madero actually except Ricardo Flores Mogón. He thought the idea of supporting another person from the upper class is absurd. And here's a broadsheet. And here Posada depicts Francisco Madero as an everyday person. He accomplishes this by but showing him with a sombrero, which he wouldn't have used. This was more of a, I showed you a photograph of indigenous people selling how the indigenous peoples would wear. And here are some vendors of products made with reed, which is this material here. This material and the products are pre-Columbian in origin. There's so much hope at this time for what the Mexican revolution will accomplish. And most Mexicans support Francisco Madero who ultimately wins the elections and becomes the first president after the people brought down Porfirio Diaz. Posada depicts Francisco Madero here as a common man, which he is not. Francisco Madero is a very, comes from a very wealthy family from the North. But to make him very relatable, Posada depicts him with a big sombrero, very traditional among indigenous men, a shawl or a tilma, rayada, over here in the verses, I'll tell you in a second what they say. And then also huaraches, which are sandals, again, widely used among indigenous men. I remember my grandfather using this, these types of shoes. And also he depicts him with a green bottle, which is, indicates that it is alcohol. And these verses are just touting the victory of Madero. And, and it just shows the, shows the euphoria that the Mexican people were feeling at at the prospect of getting rid of Diaz. For example, here, anda con su tilma bella. He, he goes with his tilma, this shawl, which is rayada and striped because it's much more traditional. And calzando también guarache. But here are some of his most often quoted lines relating to death being very democratic, where death, everyone is the same. The same death, which is fair, didn't want others to, to enjoy the bread of democracy that those who die in this conflict will leave for us. Now, the Mexican Revolution, just very quickly, had many leaders. For example, Francisco Madero, here he is. I just talked to you about him. Pancho Villa, the beloved and famous leader. Álvaro Obregón, who lost his arm in 1915. And Pedro Lascurain, that I just put him in here, but this is like the only president in history that, that held the, the shortest, whose time in power was, for, <laughs> was 45 minutes. In this engraving from 1911, Posada pays homage to one of the most revered figures in all of the Mexican Revolution, and that would be Emiliano Zapata, here in this photograph. As he was a charismatic leader, he had a huge following, and he was the one leader who had a very specific agenda, land reform. Consequently, he was extremely dangerous to the wealthy class. And here Posada shows him facing the viewer and depicts the military by defending the Hacienda system, the status quo, in a more vulnerable position from the back. We don't see their faces. And this one is even on his knees. And Posada also depicted the famous Adelita because women helped in all aspects of the revolution. La Adelita was the name given to the females who fought. Women were very fundamental during the Mexican Revolution. They fought in all fronts. As soldiers, generals, you name it, they were there. And this is paying homage to contributions of women. She's shown here on her horse, larger than life, towering above jubilant cheers from the people everyday people. And here's a famous photograph by the great photographer Agustin Victor Casasola. He shot this in 1914 in which Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa 
arrive in Mexico City, here a bunch of VA is shown, VIA in La Silla Presidencial, in the presidential seat. Easily, one of these guys could have become president because they were that popular throughout Mexico. But apparently neither one of them was interested in, in that. He was interested in land reform. That was his focus. And he was a general, an army person. But here's the great photographer, Agustin Victor Casasola. And here he is taking a selfie, a self-portrait. He's the author of this beautiful photography from the Mexican Revolution, documented absolutely and virtually all aspects of this revolution. For example, he took this photograph of the assassination of Emiliano Zapata. Emiliano Zapata had become extremely dangerous because of his focus on land reform. And here we see two very famous photographs that really capture the spirit during the Mexican Revolution. In this one, for example, the assassination of Emiliano Zapata, the 10th of April, 1919, Sola really captured the anguish and the fear in the followers of the great general Emiliano Zapata. And he's looking at the sky almost as though looking to God for answers. And I should mention that Agust Agustin Victor Casasola was one, is, one of the most, is one of the most important and renowned photographers that Mexico, a huge talent from Mexico. He virtually photographed every aspect of the revolution. In the late 19th and early 20th century, things were being photographed and filmed. And so this is also part of that printing tradition in which things were becoming widely distributed for mass consumption. And here's a photograph of the devastation of the Mexican Revolution where you can see dead human beings in front of the National Palace and a lot of horses as well. And here's what's happening to that message of order and progress. And here's the train showing the masses of people participating in the revolution and the destruction that this is causing. This is what the policies during the Porfiriato and the subjugations of the vast majority of people has wrought. And I just want to read this quote by Jean Charlot, because he was a graphic artist as well. He understood very deeply, and he was a, a great admirer of Posada's work. And he really understood the significance of what Posada was doing. This is what he writes. The revolution was a Posada still come to life, since he loved to portray anti-ideas meetings with bricks and bats flying, skulls bashed in, stabbings, shootings, Chains prisoners hemmed in between men on horseback, what had been but a line inked on paper, found its consummation in a true depth and a true bulk. The revolutionary themes of Orozco paraphrase Posada not only because of his youthful affection for the master, but much more because the revolution was first rehearsed within this balding brown head and its tableau charted by this able brown hand before it had even begun. And it refers to the revolution, of course. I just love the way Charlot captures the, the whole essence of Posada's body of work, especially what he's saying about the true depth and the true bulk. And the true bulk refers to the sheer number of artworks that, Posada, that he left us, but also the variety of themes. And that links to the true depth, which is profound meaning. And true depth is what I was saying earlier with the Velasco landscape paintings. The art of the academy may not have referred what was coming with the Mexican Revolution, but in Posada's work, we see Mexicans' lives from all angles, and there we find the true depth, that profound meaning that Charlot is talking about. Also, Posada greatly influenced Orozco and each of the great muralists, because after the revolution, the great muralists of Mexico, including Diego Rivera, Jose Clemente Orozco, and David Siqueiros, began to depict indigenous peoples and other important themes that Posada had already rehearsed to borrow from Charlot's beautiful prose. And look how beautifully Charlot phrases this. He says, the revolution was first rehearsed within this balding brown head. So in Posada's depiction of everyday life in Mexico and the true history of what people were actually experiencing, he was rehearsing the revolution in his brown head. And Charlot says, and its tableau was charted by, this, by his able brown hand. 
and brown hand refers to the fact that Posada was of indigenous descent. And what Charlot is trying to say is that intellectually, Posada understood what was coming. And that Posada was recording aspects of it before it had even begun. Beautiful. Now we'll come to that portion in section two when we focus on engraving and lithography. We'll see how Posada used each medium. I just want to very briefly introduce you to the process of lithography and engraving because they're really cool processes and they can help us to appreciate Posada's artistry and skill. And the way that I want to explain how lithography works to you is by first briefly going over the whole process and then showing you video that really illustrate this process. And here you see an example of a lithograph. And this one was printed from the original stone, as, as you can read here. And in it, Posada made a lot of exquisite details, including a pedestal, sculpture of St. Teresa, a live figure here with this gentleman, other sculptural designs, including crosses and obelisks, fountains, skulls, and lush greenery. What is lithography? Lithography is a printing process, and it's made possible from the fact that water and oil don't mix. In other words, they repel each other. What does that mean? Well, think about it. In lithography, the artist who made this sketch, in this case Posada, is not a traditional image like in a fresco or an oil on canvas. It was made on a stone in order to be reproduced. So artists work on a stone, a limestone, which is a surface that is porous. So it, it, it has a tendency to absorb. And the artist must use greasy or waxy materials. For example, tush, crayons, pencils, and different materials that must be grease-based. So once an artist makes this design, we protect the image with talc and then begins the edge process for which gum arabic and nitric acid are used. Why? Because these two substances help establish the non-image area. Non-image area would be anywhere the artist didn't depict anything on or didn't make any designs or drawings or, or lines. And you must separate that from the from the image areas so that when you go through the process of printing only the things that are in greasy ink will appear on the page so again i'll show you in video how to process this stone with the process of edge what you're doing is that you're making the stone be receptive to either water or grease once you apply gum arabic and nitric acid you leave that overnight usually and then when you come back, you wash this off with turpentine oil. And you're not really washing the image. It will, as you will see, it, what you produce here is what is called a ghost image, meaning that the, this image has been seeped into the stone. Now we're ready for printing. And in the printing process, you keep the stone damp. You, so you're going over with a sponge, you keep it damp. And then you apply with a roller ink, greasy, grease or wax based ink all over it. And because you have gone through this etching process, the stone will only absorb the ink in these areas that the artist has depicted something. And the other areas will not absorb the grease, only the water. So that's what we mean by the fact that water and oil don't mix. And in this case, they will be repelling each other. And that's why printing works in this case. And then as you will see, the first few are prints. And then the next ones are, are prints that, are, that actually show a great deal of fidelity, meaning it, it actually transfers is one of the, in all, in all printing is actually one of the methods that actually show the greatest fidelity in terms of the stroke and the, and the detailing that the artist produced in the stone. Now let me show you with short clips from video how this process works. So let's watch how the stone has to be leveled and cleaned. And the clip we're about to see is by the Edinburgh printmakers by Stone Lithography at Edinburgh Printmakers. Here's the link to their remarkable video. In stone lithography, 
The blocks of fine-grained lithographic limestone are prepared by graining two stones together with different grades of carborundum grit. With larger stones, a levigator disc may be used with grit. Grinding removes the top surface of the stone, removing the previous image and prepares a fresh clean surface ready for a new image. Care must be taken during stone graining to ensure that the stone's surface is flat and level to ensure the stone will print evenly. Now let me show you how Phil Sanders, director of the Robert Blackburn Printing Workshop at MoMA, shows in a really cool way what materials artists use to draw on lithographic stones. The surface of a lithographic stone is a very seductive surface to draw on. It's responsive and it's also sculptural. Because a stone in and of itself is receptive to water, so if I dampen the stone it absorbs the water, and it's also receptive to grease, which means it will suck the grease down in. It allows me to put drawing material down and then remove it with things like razor blades, an X-Acto knife, sandpaper. So it allows you to draw in a more sculptural way rather than having the limitations of a piece of paper. Now let me show you how Phil Sanders explains this concept of lithographic stone being open so you can see just how receptive it is to oil or grease. Watch. This stone is made from limestone. It is completely open, as we call it, which means it's receptive to grease and water at this state. So if I were to put my thumbs on the surface of the stone, that would become image area because of the grease from my skin. So it's a fairly delicate drawing surface from that standpoint, but it's also a positive in the sense that every fine mark that you can put down with a greasy material will hold in that fidelity. Then let's see how the stone and the image is treated with talc, as well as gum arabic and nitric acid. This demonstration on how to apply gum arabic and nitric acid is by Steve Dross in his video called How Stone Lithography Works. This is one of my favorite. You should watch the whole thing. Here's the link. Watch. When you're finished with your drawing, the stone is prepared with French chalk powder. This helps to protect it for the further process. The stone is then processed with a mixture of gum arabic and nitric acid. The gum separates the image area from the non-image areas. This is the etching of the stone. The drawing will receive the ink and will repel water. Usually you have to leave the stone for one day, so the etching can take place on the surface of the stone. And here Phil Sanders explains how the non-image is established in the etching process, which is crucial in printing. Watch. And it's ready to be etched. So we first apply the gum arabic to the stone, and this is to start to establish the non-image area of the stone. So what we're trying to make sure is that the whites of the stone stay that way, and they receive gum arabic, which will help them receive water later on. Once the stone has begun to receive the gum into it, we can apply the acidified gum arabic, in this case, which is tapum. That acidification with tannic acid helps keep that gum arabic permanently bonded to the stone. Now see how Steve demonstrates how a ghost image is achieved through the etching process. Then the stone is placed on the printing press. With turpentine oil, the image will be washed off the stone. After that, the stone is prepared with a thin layer of oily ink. By doing this, you remove the water-soluble gum edge. Now the stone is ready for print. Now let me show you how the etched stone behaves in printing and how to apply the water and the greasy ink with a roller. Watch once again Steve demonstrating. The drawn image receives ink and the rest of the image receives water. Before printing you have to keep the stone wet with water so that the ink will not print the empty areas. On a piece of glass you mix the ink and roll it with an ink roller. 
before applying the ink onto the stone, the stone needs to be wet. You roll several times on the stone with the ink. And now here's the most difficult step, which I did not even put it here because it's that complicated. Watch. Then you need to fan the stone so that the water dries. That was from Steve's video. And I just had to make that joke because here I was watching all these artists perform magic, basically. And then someone's fanning <laughs> the materials to dry. And to close this section on lithography, I want you to see this demonstration, once again by Phil Sanders, about fidelity in lithography and the tonal range that can be achieved in this specific type of printing. We can achieve a different tonal range based on the softness of that paper. What we want to do is match that movement and flow of the hand. So what I'm looking for when I look at this is to see if it feels as if a hand has moved across that surface with a drawing material. And if it has, and if it maintains that character, then I would consider that a good impression. Now engraving is a little bit different because in engraving, the artist uses this tool called the burin. And the engraver uses this burin to make incisions, cuts, or grooves onto a surface. Usually it's a metal, including silver, copper, or zinc. Now this process is also very complicated, but the main difference is that you make the image with this burin and the processing doesn't usually involve all the chemicals that you would use in lithography. So the process is that the first thing is that the metal plate would be covered with a wax ground. And one thing I should mention is that there are different types of burin with different tips. And those are very useful because one of the most creative decisions engravers make is the quality of the line or incisions that they make on this metal surface with their burin. And those incisions or cuts will be where the ink will be held for printing. So as I wrote in here is the opposite of woodcut because that's relief printing. And intaglio is the printing technique. And the traditional process is actually simpler than lithography. So you have a metal that you cover with wax ground. The artist makes the design. Once the engraver is done with the image here, ink is applied, excess is removed with, tar with a tarlatan cloth, and voila, it's ready for printing. I found this fabulous video in which Andrew Stein Raftery, who's a professor and practicing engraver, he takes us through the process of engraving step by step. I'll just show you highlights, including how to apply wax to the surface of the plate, and how they begin incising lines as a guideline for the whole design. I'm going to melt a little bit of wax onto this plate and then spread it out with a roller. I'm going to use the tracing and then trace through the tracing paper with the stylus and that's going to leave the drawing on the plate just lightly touched onto the wax. We can see the impression of the outlines into the wax and I'll be able to follow those outlines with the dry point tool and scratch those lines in to have a guideline for the whole process. So what I'm doing right now is I'm using this steel tool to scratch the lines in the plate. I'm following the lines I made with the wax that are impressed in the wax and I'm scratching them in the plate with the tool. And what this is going to do is going to give me a very very pale outline that I can follow throughout the engraving process. Now let's see him demonstrating the actual engraving process. He begins by explaining the elements of the burin and how to use it. He begins by explaining the characteristics of the shaft and how it's fitted onto this handle. But then he shows us this process. It's been inserted in this handle and polished and sharpened so that these three planes come to a perfect point. So I engage the tool in one of my dry pointed lines. And as I'm pushing the plate, a curl of copper is emerging. And that curl of copper is called the burr. When I get to the end of the line, I pull out the burin, and I take this tool called the scraper, and I use the scraper to cut off the burr. And here I just want to show you that in this example from Skeletons Riding Bicycles, 
I want you to focus on the diversity in the markings that Posada made. One of the things that is so unique to this medium of engraving is that the quality of line is so important. The lines can be very uniform and sharp. And in this case, Posada shows, shows off his skills with a burin by executing a range or diversity of lines here. We have very uniform lines, and then we have very sharp lines, and other cuts that are very saturated in color. And also in his use of light and dark lines, shows a very efficient way, shows a very clever way of, of achieving the chiaroscuro, a Renaissance technique for to depict volume. As you can see here in the treatment of the ribs, for example, or in the use over here to, to depict three-dimensional space. And here you can see that he, he may have used different types of burin because you see a great diversity of lines. Some are very thick and some are very fine. And again, this is, this is what distinguishes the art of the engraver, the way in which they wield their burin to depict this cross-hatching and how it is to hold the ink for printing. And look at that. This view really shows a diversity in lines wielded with a burin here. And one more thing I really should mention is what this scholar, Maria Garone of the UNAM, explained in the documentary that I spoke about earlier, Posada, el genio desconocido, Posada, the unknown genius. She says, Posada era un calígrafo, un dibujante de letras y dibujante de imágenes. Tenía una habilidad quirográfica estupenda. So he was a calligrapher. He drew letters, not just the images. And that his calligraphy was pretty remarkable. That's what she says in the documentary. And over here, you can see what she's talking about. And she, she explains in this film that Posada would import books from the American Type Founders Company from the United States. And that in each of his compositions, he would actually, he would not only make the design of the graphic itself, but he would actually choose what type each line would have. And as you can see here, there's different types that he uses for this one particular broadsheet, which is a, a loose page. This is a broadsheet, which in the 19th century, they were printed in, in large quantities for mass distribution. And because there were mass produced and very cheaply with this technology, the masses could afford to buy, to glue on the wall, to read or to have around. And this is part of ephemera, meaning very disposable art. So on each of the commissions that Posada took, he would conceive of the whole design by carefully choosing each detail, including the stenciling, the fonts, of course, the main image, this engraving, and also the verses, and how each of these elements would be distributed on the page. Notice, for example, on this board game, the distribution for the game itself, all the decorations around it, and the text. And look at all the details. Here's his signature and date, by the way. He made this in 1911. He depicts a lot of chickens, and given that it's a competitive game, a lot of predators. Here's one with a sheep. Here's another one with a dove or a bird, and here's a human with a rifle next to a beautiful cactus. And look at the fountains and the chickens and the beautiful plants, very pretty. Here's a close-up of the fountain and the typeset at the top, the title, and here's the chicken. God knows if he's gonna make it. We have arrived at the third and final portion of the lecture. First, we're going to analyze La Calavera Electrica, and then we'll close with reflections on Posada's legacy. So by now you have so much context to analyze a broadsheet like this one. As you would now know, this would have been widely distributed and it's a loose leaf that includes not only an engraving, but it also includes decorations as this stenciling here. He chooses the font and he also works in collaboration with a poet and together they come up with these verses. This broadsheet is called Gran Calavera Electrica, or the Great Electric Skull, from 1907. So I want to tell you what these verses say in the context of analyzing the imagery. 
So I'm, so we're going to look, we're going to take a closer look at this. And here it is printed on a yellow, on a different color sheet. But here's the broadsheet so you can see the context. And this is what we're going to look at. First of all, let me translate this because it will help you to understand the imagery. It says, Gran Calavera Eléctrica, Great Electric Skull, Que se les va a regalar, that will be given to you all. Calavera muy fachosa de pura electricidad. Very ridiculous skull with pure electricity. And obviously I put the text, the translation for you. Oh, I didn't translate this one. El primero de noviembre, como diablos correrán. Los eléctricos vagones que a dolores llegarán. So he's talking about various things here. He's talking about the first of November, which clearly refers to the Day of the Dead or El Día de los Muertos. And then how the devil are they going to run to get to Dolores. And Dolores is a play on words because Dolores means pains, but it's also the name of the main cemetery in Mexico. And he's saying here, how the devil are they going to run these electric wagons directly to Dolores? So he's making fun of this whole thing uh, about regarding you, you. Yes, you're going to go faster, but where are you going to the cemetery? <laughs> and over here, he did a very... Uh, it's a very irreverent, this is what he thinks about it. He made a little dog peeing on the whole thing. And now here you understand that this skull standing is already beaming electricity. And even though this skull and skeleton is full of electricity, he's still nothing but a skull. And this skull is talking to these other ones and it's actually making a connection. Like he's, this skull is transmitting all the electricity. And to understand this, you have to think back of what we discussed earlier in the lecture. All that business regarding order and progress and this desire to bring all the modern things that la that the world has to offer to Mexico. And Mexico becomes absolutely modernity itself because from the moment Posada was a child until the 1900s, things have changed dramatically. It was such a different world and things, and, and the change was rather fast as well. But I think at least for me, the, the commentary here is not just the change, and the fact that these wagons came just like the train that I showed you earlier in the Velasco paintings, this train is actually transporting people super fast. But the joke is you're still just going to the cemetery here. And something else that we could comment on would be the fact that Posada is saying it will be given to you. I don't know, should we believe this? What will be the externalities associated with electricity? And above all, will electricity really be given to everyone? That has not been the case with everything else. In Mexico in the late 19th century, things were being partitioned and many people lost their lands, for example, and they were emerging here in Mexico from a very unjust system. So then we have to reflect about this elation and fascination with electricity. I told you that I lived in Mexico from 2011 to 2012 and I had this lady from Oaxaca helping me. And it was one of the best things because she guided me so well with everything that I had to do. And she had a child the same age as I did. So the kids played all the time. And then one time I asked her how to pay the electric bill the first day, the first month that I was there. She had no idea how to help me. And this is because as astounding as it may sound, not everyone in Mexico in the 21st century has access to electricity in Mexico City. So think about that when you analyze this artwork. And now to close the lecture, I will offer some reflections on Posada's artistic legacy. His renown is undoubted. The Mexican post office in the 20th century honored this master of engraving with commemorating stamps. And in this postage, Posada is doubly honored because these postage stamp features Posada, but this is not Posada depicting himself. Rather, is the artist Leopoldo Mendes, who created this line of in 1953. In the series honoring Posada the artist, Correos Mexicanos included this image, which is a really stunning portrayal that really captures the essence of Jose Guadalupe Posada. First of all, Mendes made this in 1953, but he inserted the date here, 1902, which is the year that the artist Leopoldo Mendes was born. That happens to be when unrest begins in opposition to the Porfiriato. 1902 would be the year when activities pointing to a revolution are getting stronger. 
Leopoldo Mendes depicts here the celebrated artist Jose Guadalupe Posada as an idealistic portrayal. Nevertheless, I think it's a very realistic one and really captures different aspects of Posada, the person and the artist. Because the image is not depicting one thing that the artist is doing. It's, it's a, again, it encapsulates everything that Posada was all about. Let me explain. Posada is seen here holding his burin and working on, a, on an engraving. He is taking a break to look out the window. And what he sees is a federales whacking and attacking peasants and indigenous peoples. You see people with sombreros and wearing very traditional outfits. Evoking the story that you just heard from the Mexican Revolution, from, from the, evoking that story that I just told you from the Porfiriato and Mexican Revolution. And this is precisely the way that what Posada's method is, observing life as it unfolds outside. And that's what he's recording here. And the other theme that it encapsulates, the fact that not only is he working as an artist, but he's also working within, in the printing shop. And here in the scene within the print shop, we see the Mogon brothers, Ricardo here in the front, holding a loose leaf regarding the in a text that actually evokes this unrest. And perhaps because Mendes is an artist who deeply understood what Posada was doing in his process, it's showing that Posada was always working with his Buren. But as he was doing that, he was watching the action outside to report it with the rest of the people who worked in the print shop. And they're coming up together to report on the events happening outside. This is precisely what he did to denounce these sort of tragedies, to denounce this injustice. And this fourth unidentified man, at least I don't know who he is, it's actually working on the typeset that is going to bring us and the people of Mexico the unfolding of these events that wouldn't otherwise be told. And here's another example of a stamp from the series on Posada by Correos Mexicanos. This one is of an engraving from a broadsheet by Posada. This one featuring Don Quixote attacking all the liars. It says here on this verse. And this one to me is so full of meaning because Don Quixote was an Hidalgo, someone from the upper class. And yet he read so much that he began to attack all the evils of the world like this. And he was very idealistic. And of course, this novel by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra published the first part published in 1605 and then, and then the second one in 1615 is one of the most influential pieces in world, in, world lit, in world literature and emerges during the Spanish Golden Age. And I cannot leave this one piece out. El Suceso del Baile de los 41. It refers to an event that occurred in 18 November 1901. There was a party in a very affluent neighborhood. And in violation of civil liberties, the police came in and arrested most people because they were doing some things that they considered indecent. Because among the attendees, there were cross-dressers. Now, reportedly, one of the men in attendance was President Porfirio Diaz's son-in-law. And while most of the attendees were arrested and punished, Porfirio Diaz tried everything in his power to prevent the story from leaking out. Nevertheless, it was widely published in the press. And here's Posada's rendition of the event. And as an illustrious thinker of our generation, Carlos Monsivais, sadly he already passed away, said that this episode invented homosexuality in Mexico. And what that means is that it is depicting events in the lives of a group that is denied a space in our society. But the homophobia in Mexico was so high, was so great, that I've heard that 41 became a non-desirable number, that people would skip. It's a little bit like our number 13 here in the United States, that people say, like, that we're going to the 13th floor, where well, you don't put 13th, but you put 14th. So something like this, they would skip 41. And the story is that there were 42 people, but it, because of Porfirio Diaz's, it, because he was so powerful, they erased the name of his son-in-law from the story. But again, it was, it was huge news in Mexico at the time. And this is the subject of our next lecture, so I'm not going to go into great 
detail here just to say that, and I'll just say that Posada was very influential, was very influential on the great masters who after the revolution received commissions to portray the history of Mexico. And these great muralists, including muralists, including Diego Rivera here in a self-portrait as a child, Diego Rivera, David Siqueiros, and Jose Clemente Orozco were very influenced by Posada's work. And one of the themes in the in these masters' work is the inclusion of indigenous peoples. And here we see in Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in the Alameda, Rivera is paying homage to Posada here holding a cane and in a suit next to his famous creation, which Rivera called La Catrina. just like Posada's artwork. Thank you for watching and these are the works cited.